Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday afternoon keynote. Uh, my name is Nino Russell. I am the Vice President of Services for SETC. So if you have any questions at all and you see me, ask me, and then I'll call Lee Krause. Where's Lee Krause? <laughs> I'll call Lee and get the answer. Uh, but no, any way I can help you, please, uh, if you uh, have any questions and you see me, I will try to help you. Um, so this is our Thursday afternoon keynote, our first convention keynote, and I'm very excited to uh, introduce uh, this person to all of you. And I'm going to start with the SETC ethos statement. SETC is resolutely committed to equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in the life and culture of our organization. We are actively interrogating our policies and practices to deliberately take action and institutionalize anti-racist and anti-oppressive policies and practices. SETC will work to center marginalized voices, bodies, and stories. We will listen and learn about racism, discrimination, and adversity. Now I would like to read the Lexington Area Land Acknowledgement, which comes courtesy of Lexington Children's Theater. Indigenous peoples have lived on the land now called Kentucky for at least 12,000 years. Every community owes its existence and heritage to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and stories to making the history that led to this moment. Indigenous peoples have always lived on the land that is now called Kentucky and continue to live here today. The place we now call Kentucky is primarily Shawnee, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Osage land. A commonly cited claim many of us heard in history class growing up is that this region was merely a hunting ground. This claim is a myth perpetuated at first by land speculators who wished to improve land sales and still today to absolve settler colonists and their descendants from grappling with their history of land theft, genocide, and white supremacy. The continuation of this myth, myth is harmful for all of us. Now, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for the afternoon, Skylar Fox. Skylar is a director, playwright, and creator of Magic and Illusions for Theater. He cares about making wildly theatrical plays and musicals that push the boundaries of what theater can do to tell demandingly vulnerable stories powerfully. As a magic designer, Skylar is the Illusions and Magic Associate for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child on Broadway and around the world, and has created magic for Fat Ham, which was at the Public Theater, and National Black Theater and Broadway Upcoming. You Will Get Sick at the Roundabout Theater, A Beautiful Noise Associate Design Broadway, Damn Yankees Shaw Festival, and Dracula, the Maltz Jupiter Theater. He also has cons uh, consulted on The Tonight Show, The Tony Awards, and San Diego Comic Con. He is the co-artistic director of Night Drive, where he has directed and co-written an Apocalypse Around a Campfire, The Grown Up Secret Location, a live immersive alien movie, Alien Nation Paradise Factory, a five-dimensional community meeting with a full pancake breakfast, Providence, Rhode Island, The Tank, a haunted rock concert, thank you, sorry, Ars Nova, and a hybrid comic book with interactive animation, Apathy Boy, The Brick, and Ars Nova, 2015 O'Neill finalist, he also directed and co-created The Annotated History of the American Muskrat by John Kuntz at the New Ohio Boston Center for the Arts. Other directing credits include Pussy Sludge by Gracie Gardner, 2017 Relentless Award at the Here Arts Center, Juliet and Romeo at the Brick, and the Boston premieres of the six-hour genre-bending epic The Valentine Trilogy, and of Sarah Rule's Passion Play, for which he was nominated for an Ernie Award. Fox holds a BA in Theater and Arts Performance Studies from Brown University. And with that, I would like to welcome Skylar to the stage. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate you. Thank you. Hey, how are you all doing today? 
Doing all right? Um, I see you. Well, let's take a moment, right? There aren't that many of us in the room. Do you want to scooch in a little bit? Can we just take a second here and gather up and gather in just a little bit? I know you might have to escape. It's okay, but that way I won't miss anyone far to the side. So let's just gather in and get close. As long as you're comfortable, right? We'll take a second here right at the beginning and I'll get set up. Thank you so much. Amazing. Are you all having a good conference so far? Okay. Sounds, that sounds like about 2 p.m. Uh, Made right through the second day of a conference. Um, a, as you heard, my name's Skylar. Uh, I direct plays, I write plays, and I do this really weird specific job where I design magic and illusions for theater. Um, I'm the Illusions and Magic Associate for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child on Broadway and around the world. So what that means is when the show came to Broadway from the West End, I joined the magic team with our designer, Jamie Harrison, and adapted that magic they created in the West End for Broadway. And now I go around the world and direct the magic for Harry Potter every place it opens around the world. I also develop shows with companies like the Royal Shakespeare Company, Roundabout, you heard the public. Um, and uh, in fact, one of the shows from the public, Fat Ham, which won the Pulitzer in playwriting last year, is going to Broadway. And we're working on that right now. So I'm flying out of here tomorrow to go back into tech for that. Um, but the, the point is, with all of this work, right, um, what I do, what the job fundamentally is, is expanding the possibilities of what we can do in space and time in order to tell a story powerfully. Yeah? Um, now, before I get started today, I want to talk to you about something really important, something that I think is going to fundamentally change all of our lives. And this thing is the ABBA hologram show in London. Because <laughs> it's cool. Have any of you heard about this, this ABBA hologram show, ABBA Voyage? Okay, I'll give you a quick summary for those of you who don't know what this is, right? Uh, do you know the band ABBA of Mamma Mia? Everyone know that? Okay, okay Mamma Mia, here we go again. Yeah, vaguely fine. Um, they created a show at a custom arena outside of London where you can go. Now, ABBA's been around for a while. They've been around since the 70s or so, right? And you can see a live concert of them from the 70s with them performing in hologram form on stage, not in their current bodies, in their 1970s bodies, performing a full concert on stage. Now, we hear this, and we have an idea of what that means, right? But I have a good friend of mine who's a producer, Disney Theatrical, <laughs> who saw the show, and he came to me, and I, I asked him how it was, and he, he said that he saw it, and he wept. Because, and these are his words, you think you know what a hologram is going to look like but it feels like they're there with you. It really feels like they're there with you. And for a second, I got nervous. Did anyone get nervous hearing that a little bit? Because I think, what does that mean for live theater, right? But the next second, I got really excited because I had the exact same thought. What is that going to mean for live theater? I'll explain what I mean in a second, but the fundamental truth is Things like this, moments of innovation like this, force us to look in the mirror and think, how are we going to innovate this field, right? And push the limits of what we can do. How are we going to justify why we're needed to make live theater as performers, right? As designers, directors, stage managers, technicians. This is going to matter. It matters right now. And that's why I'm so happy I'm here at SCTC with this group of people. Um, how many of y'all are educators? Would you mind raising your hand? Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to be speaking to educators because you are shaping my future collaborators, the people I get to make work with for the rest of my life, right? And those, that, raise your hand if you're a student or studying theater right now in some way. Give yourselves a big round of applause, yeah. I am excited to be speaking to you today because you are going to make the theater that I get to see that breaks my brain for the rest of my life, right? And expands what I think is possible. Now, I know that sounds a lot of responsibility, and it is. I'm not going to lie, right? But it matters. The people in this room, you are in an important phase of your life. You're not before something, right? You are creators of our future as an art form and an industry, and that matters. The things you make now and the decisions you make now matter. And they matter to me being in, in the middle of my career, okay? Now, referring back here, do, 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 do. beautiful. Um, 
I want, I want to tell you, I don't think we're going to fix this all <laughs> in this room here together. We're not going to figure out an answer. I'm not going to try to do that in the half hour, hour I have to speak to you. And because that would be real magic, and that's not what I do. Um, I do tricks. Uh, I, I make it seem like more things are possible than are, so that you might give an audience the impression that more things are possible than they think which kind of subtly gives us the feeling or the idea that we're capable of more than we think we are. Does that make sense? So there's no real magic happening, but the hope we create, hopefully, right, is real. The sense that there is possibility out there. Lovely. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you for being patient with this. I don't usually give speeches. I, I, I stand behind the scenes and make plays. Um, but, uh, you know, to be fair, when I was thinking about this speech, I was thinking, well, this is a lot like theater, right? It feels like a huge amount of responsibility because the reality of what happens when we make theater, right, in whatever form we do that, we ask people for time in their lives they are never going to get back. Even if they're showing up for free, an audience who shows up to see your work is giving you a piece of their life and then putting it in your hands. And I feel, you know, to be honest, you know, I feel that a little bit with all of you, right? I feel like it's like making theater in that way, which is, makes me nervous and makes me excited. But the thing I remind myself, you know, because has anyone ever gone into a bit of a hole? Like, is there any point to doing this? Like, I feel like, why are we doing theater right now? Yeah, I, all the time. At least, if you don't do it at least once a year, I, th I think you should. You know what I mean? It's important <laughs> to have that moment. But the thing that I remind myself and I, and I ask you to remind yourselves for a moment here is, and this is true of theater, and this is true of us in this room right now. If you think about it, every moment in the history of the universe has led to this exact group of people sharing a room together right now. And everything that will ever happen in the future will be because of how we share a room together right now. Does that make sense? I'm going to go back. I'm going to do a little bit of origin story, like a little bit of the boring part, which is like how I ended up doing this weird job. And then I'm going to do a more interesting part, which is how Magic and Theater ended up married in this really specific weird way it is now. Um, as for me, I started doing Magic when I was four. I got a magic kit uh, for a birthday from an aunt, and I went in the other room and popped in a VHS, and I was hooked. And at the same time, I was falling in love with theater. I started doing creative things from a very young age, and that's what I loved. I was directing friends in plays and making props and costumes at my kindergarten arts and crafts station, right? This is what I've always loved to do, and I wanted to do it professionally from a young age. You don't have to. I was just a weirdo who thought that was a good idea. Um, my parents asked me what I wanted for my eighth birthday, and I told them a street performing license because <laughs> I was crazy, and they got it for me because they're crazy. And so I was out on the streets juggling machetes and making balloon animals and doing magic for when I was eight, right? And at the same time, I was doing plays with my friends. And these were kind of parallel paths, right? I was doing magic more and more professionally because it was a way I could save money for college, you know? And I was, doing, uh, I was doing theater in my public school theater programs in middle school and high school. And at a certain point, there was kind of a click for me late in high school where I was like, you know, I think I have to zero in a little bit. You know what I mean? I have to focus a little bit. And magic is something you fundamentally do alone. And theater is something you do with other people. And I loved making things with other people. So I was kind of like, I don't know if I do magic anymore. Maybe I kind of I know I want to direct plays. I want to create plays. So maybe I'm going to stop doing magic. And first of all, we now know hindsight. I did not stop doing magic, right? But at the time, I was also making a big mistake. I want to say that to everyone in the room, right? Do not give up any of the things that make you interesting or specific or different because you think you need the time or attention to focus on your work. Those things are what are going to lead you to the most meaningful things you do in your life, right? The combination of all of who you are. And if there are spaces that are asking you to be less of who you are to fit into them, those are not good spaces to walk into. Does that make sense? Now, I didn't know that at the time. So I was like, I'm not going to do magic anymore. And I went to school to get a bachelor's in theater. And I was directing and writing plays. And I can look back and see that when I was directing these plays, every way I would solve a problem on stage was magic. Right? I didn't know to call it that because I was just like, well, that's what staging is. That's what design is. But it was always someone needs to just be there. Okay, well, they need to appear. Right? 
And I would never have called it magic, but it was a way of thinking that I developed that fit into this world. So long story short, I go out into the professional world. I'm making plays with my company, Night Drive, and I still do that and love to do that. Um, and putting magic in those plays that I didn't know to call magic. And then Harry Potter comes along. And this is, I, I'm going to go a little anecdote off the side of this, because I think it is important for especially uh, the students in the room to hear. The way I ended up working on Harry Potter was I sent an email. I had been following this Scottish theater company I thought was really cool, called Vox Modus, for a long time. And they, because I was running this company in New York, and I was like, you know, we don't make the same work, but there's something about their spirit that I love. It feels right to me. It feels familiar. And at the same time, I love, does anyone know the director, John Tiffany, or the choreographer, Stephen Hoggett? They're the folks who did Harry Potter, but I'd been seeing their work coming up um, also in Northern England and Scotland and loved their work. Didn't know any relationship between these companies. But I looked up, and I was like, when are they next in New York? Maybe I could get coffee with them. Maybe I could work with them. It seemed pretty unattainable, because they'd made, won a bunch of Tony Awards and done a bunch of things. But I was like, maybe. And I, I was looking. I was like, oh, it's Harry Potter. Great. Well, I'm not going to assistant direct Harry Potter on Broadway or whatever that I thought I was going to do. And I was looking down the staff list. And under magic and illusion design, there was a name, Jamie Harrison, who happened to be the artistic director of Vox Modus. It was that other company. And I emailed him and said, hey, you're not going to believe me, because I know you work on Harry Potter, but I I've been following your company forever. This is my company. I had no idea you did magic. This is something I do, too. Can we talk? And this is how long ago this was. We got on Skype in a theater lobby a few days later, and we were talking. We didn't even talk about Harry Potter, because we realized we had so much in common from our growing up and how we both were magicians who fell in love with theater and kind of moved away from magic and felt like theater people. And at the end of the call, he said, who told you to reach out to me? And I was like, I have to be honest, no one. I, I, I know it's nerdy. I've been following Vox Modus forever. And he said, no, no, you can tell me who, who told you to, to reach out to me. I said, I promise you no one. And he said, because the day before you did, our producers reached out and said, we need to find a magic person in the U.S. for this show. And then there were six months of interviews. <laughs> So they interviewed every magic person in New York. But I wouldn't have been in that pool, right? I wouldn't have connected with this person who's a, a mentor and a dear friend had I not sent an email. Be fearless about reaching out to the people you admire and whose work you admire and tell them specifically why. A lot of people are going to say, hey, you're famous, right? But not, hey, that moved me, right? Hey, that works for me. Hey, that's like me. Does that make sense? Everyone who's in a position like me has been in your position had to ask for help with nothing immediately to return. And it feels good to be asked for help. Okay, so I'll take that with you. Do with that what you will. That's my little boring origin story. Now I design magic for a bunch of things. But let's talk about magic and theater. It's a natural combination because it's actually been around and they've been together for kind of as long as theaters existed. Early humans had shamanism, which is basically you sit, right, you're sitting around a fire. This is a religious ceremony that had magic in these performances. In Greek theater, we'll go way ahead in history from early shamanism, but in Greek theater, there were these people called thaumaturgies. Has anyone heard this word? You've heard dramaturgy, right? And some people have heard dramaturgy, maybe? Thaumaturgy. It translates to wonder maker. And these were people that had to create a spectacle at the end of a Greek play to convince people to believe in the gods, right? There's a funny thing. Do you know the word, uh, term suspension of disbelief? We use it in theater all the time, right? I like to think suspension of just disbelief is just like a very safe way of saying belief. Does that make sense? It's belief with permission to not believe later. <laughs> We're creating a little bit of a safety barrier from, from the religious origins of theater, but it's, that's, it's just an interesting thing to keep in mind. Um, and to today, it's been part of theater, and I bet you've all made magic on stage, whether or not you think you have. Because magic is just solving impossible problems, and how many of you, when you really think about it, have had to solve an impossible problem? on stage, right? Yes, all the time. You are magic makers, right? If you think about the most like, basic thing, like the most basic play, imagine like a house, kitchen sink set, right? And you describe what that is. Well, we had to cut a house in half and stick it on stage. That's pretty magical, right? The reason it might not feel magical to us is it's become convention, right? And there's something about when something becomes uh, regular or expected to us, where it doesn't speak to us anymore. That's because the currency of theater is surprise. 
the way we impact people in theater is surprise. Taylor Mack, who's a playwright and performer, says that surprise can be as small as a breath or as big as the theater falling down around you, right? But it matters. And surprise is how we are able to communicate effectively and emotionally with people. And when we lean too hard into convention, we give up our tools, right? When we do things the way they've been done before, or in conversation with the way the audience has seen or understands, we can't control how we communicate or impact with them. We actually need to create new ways of doing things in order to communicate impactfully. Yeah? So. I want to try something. Actually, this is good. I remind myself I have a little exercise with this. Um, those of you who were with me last night might have already done this. We're going to try this all together. We do a warm-up at the beginning of some magic rehearsal. Would you all be willing to warm up with me? Those who are comfortable, you can stand. If you're more comfortable sitting, you sit. Um, we're going to just do this. We're going to start to shake out our hands. Is that all right? Feel free to stand up if you're comfortable standing up. If you're comfortable sitting down, that is perfect. Just shake out your hands. Shake out your hands. We're doing Muppets. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. I just want you to follow what I do. Stop. Now I want you to do what I do exactly as I do it. I don't want you to try to follow me. I don't want you to lead. I just want you to do it exactly as I'm doing it. You all look great doing this. <laughs> great. <laughs> So this is a key lesson in magic and how people understand stories. We walk through, you can sit down by the way, thank you very much. We walk through the world making assumptions, right? Hundreds of assumptions a second. It's how I know my hand isn't a spider every time I look at it. Assumptions are just stories we tell ourselves about how the world works, right? And when we lean into people's assumptions, we're unable to create moments of wonder and of impact because they have context to think, ah, he's clapped before, he's going to clap again. Does that make sense? But it's important to empathize with people's assumptions and think deeply about the stories we tell ourselves in order to create wonder, yeah? The basis for magic and the basis for communication is empathy. One and the same. Now we're going to talk about how we do magic on stage. I'm not going to give away big secrets because, like, the internet can do that for you, and, like, we don't have the time to go into, like, how every single thing works. Honestly, it's all on the internet. Magicians adopted the internet way before everyone else. They tend to adopt technology very quickly, and that's part of how magic is made, right? But um, what I am going to talk about is how magic in theater is made and give you a bit of a system, how I design magic for theater, how you can think about creating magic for theater if you want to do it, because you all already have, and I hope you'll all leave here and do that in the various ways you can. Um, First things first, to create magic in theater, you need limits. We've all seen movies, right? That's a crazy question. You've all seen movies and TV. And if you want someone to fly in a movie, you can make it look and sound exactly like they're flying, right? But no one in this room believes that person's flying. In film, the limitation is so different, right? There aren't limits the same way there are in theater. In theater, we have to actually be in the same room at the same time and we know we're sharing the same laws of physics. There can't be a green screen. It can't be edited later. Yeah? So we need limits to create things that are magical. And in your life and in your creativity, think about your limits as your friends. Yeah? Your limitations are what breed creativity. We have $500 to do this show. I've seen some of the best shows I've ever seen for budgets under $500. Right? We have two weeks to make this show. Okay. Those limitations are interesting. Yes, and they are part of what you're creating. We are in the same room together in the, at the same time. That is an interesting limitation, right? In fact, when we lean into our limitations, it's something we call in magic rolling up our sleeves. You know when a magician goes, see, there's nothing up my sleeve? We do that on stage with magic all the time. We'll have, if someone's going to walk through a wall, say, we'll have someone lean on that wall earlier in the play because it's showing, look, someone can lean on this wall, right? We're showing off a limitation in order to break through someone's assumption. So number one, you need limits, and you need to understand your limits. Yeah? And have a relationship with them, a fun relationship with your limitations. So you can push them. The second thing you need to do is lead with your why. And if there's one thing I want you all to leave with today, it's thinking about leaving with your why. Because magic is not a series of moves, it's not a series of secrets, who cares? If I gave you an assignment, like make someone fly in this room right now, you'd all think of 10 ways to do it that I'd never thought of. Because you're creative, right? 
But the key uh, uh, to answer how to do something is why would you do it, right? Magic is storytelling. It's not a series of moves. It's just telling a story because a piece of magic is only as interesting as its context, as why you're doing it. So how do we design magic for theater? I ask four questions when I walk into a show, and that's how I design magic. The first question is, why are we doing this play? Why are we doing this musical? Why are we making this piece? And I don't mean like the answer, because we all can like justify why we're doing Cats on the Moon, whatever it is, right? We can make up something that like sounds good for someone else. But like deep down, when I look in the mirror, why am I doing this? And not why is it important for other people to see it? Why is there something vulnerable and mushy that I am trying to explore about myself, right? When I'm looking at my collaborators, that's what I want. That's what I want to tap into, right? What's something challenging about being a person that I don't know how to deal with in words, so I have to deal with it with other people in space? You know what I mean? We'd start from there. Why are we doing this play? So let's pick a play. Does everyone know Our Town? Or a lot of people know the play Our Town? It's like pretty well known. Okay, great, fine. Let's take Our, our Town's like my favorite play, but it's also like so overdone, right? Big balance. Let's talk about it. Let's put some magic in Our Town. Why do Our Town? A lot of reasons. Does anyone? Why do Our Town? Why? What, feel, what feelings do you have that are in our time? If you're directing right now, I know I'm asking you to be very vulnerable in front of a group of people, but I promise you'll be rewarded. Hmm, interesting. It's saying it takes something distant far away and connects you to it. That's interesting. I'll say for, oh yes, please. Hmm. Um, hmm. Yes. To pull these two things together, because I've thought a lot about this play, what I love about it is it presents us with a seemingly impossible balance. Can we live our life fully and appreciate our life fully at the same time? Right? Can we watch? Can we be inside of? And are those two things possible at the same time? And while it seems to say no, the tragedy of the play is no, the thing that I love is theatrically the twist of it is that because it is a play, yes, we're given the opportunity to actually do those things, to live inside of a feeling and watch a feeling at the same time, right? And there's something beautiful in that for us as artists, that we are a conduit to allowing people to experience those two things simultaneously while they're alive. Yeah? So, okay, those are great reasons to do the play. That's the first question. Why would you do this play? Second, what are moments in the play that feel like they most speak to those feelings for us? When we think about the, the moments, in the piece that most connect. I'll give us a few, right? Emily going back, right? I mean, when she goes back into her life and no one could see her, but she can see everything clearly. That's a big one for me, right? So let's take, play with that one. We could pick five, ten, right? I love uh, end of act one when the stage manager says, okay, you can go take, <laughs> to go take a smoke. I think that there was something there where he literally, like, Princess Bride breaks the play for us. We're inside of something really magical. Yes. Yes, yes, these are moments that we're, we're pulling something together with, the moments that we remember and impact us. We all love theater, right? If we're in this room, we love theater, I think, probably. Maybe you have a complicated love for theater, but we say yes. Okay. I would venture to say that you love theater not because you love all the theater you see and read. Is that true? You probably love theater because, at least this is for me, you've seen five or ten things in your life that broke your brain and changed your life. We are going to spend the rest of our lives trying to make those plays for other people. Yeah? We're not in it because we love everything. We're in it for these moments. Because when you think about those five to ten plays, I bet you don't think of the whole play. You think of moments. Yeah? So these are the impactful moments we're trying to find. Okay, so that's question number two. Question number three, how could a moment of magic make these moments feel more like they feel to us? Right? How could we communicate a non-textual feeling more powerfully with magic? I'll give an example, right? Well, Emily's doing Goodbye Grover's Corners, and listen, we've all seen that monologue a lot of times, right? 
what if she's seeing all these things, and what if they just dissolved in front of her as she was saying goodbye to them? Yeah? I don't know. It might be really impactful. Right? Now notice, we haven't touched question number four yet, which is now how would I do that? But the first three out of four questions, you get 75% of the way there, and you're not touching how. Right? You're leading with your why. And when you walk into a room, right, where someone is asking of your artistry, lead with your why am I here. And if it isn't connecting to why you are there, work on finding a way for it to connect. And if it can't, it's okay to find a place where it will. Does that make sense? Being mission-driven, and it is early in your career, it is so easy to just say, i got to say yes to everything. I want to work. Fair. Right? But still lead with a why. Yeah? Okay. So, we're making magic. We know our limits. We lead with a why. Right? And then we collaborate. Every moment of magic in Harry Potter, in any of the shows I work on, is touched by every department. Wigs, hair, and makeup touches every piece of magic we do in the show. We cannot do impossible things alone. You need to band together and learn how to create deeply collaboratively, right? What that means is not being like, and here is a scenic design, lighting, how are you going to light that? It means us getting in a room and getting in touch with our why together so we can build something new, right? Something genuinely innovative where we don't use the limits of our own creativity to stop us before we get started. Yeah, I know I'm speaking kind of abstractly, but does this kind of make sense? Okay. The truth is, magic's really hard. <laughs> I should say, it's impossibly hard. That's the other reason to collaborate. You don't want to be alone when you're doing something so hard and vulnerable, right? It's nice to feel like you have other people there with you who are swinging at something big, something that is barely possible. Because you just might get there. So if it's so hard to do magic, why should we do it at all? That is a fair question, right? There are lots of things that are hard about theater. Why do we need to add something really hard to it? Why does it matter? Um, especially because with magic, failure is public and obvious. You know what I mean? You don't know when someone goes up on a line unless you've memorized the play and no one in the audience has memorized the play. But if a magic trick goes wrong, we know, right? Sometimes. Anyway, we know. When you're really putting yourself out there, when you're being vulnerable, when you're leading with a why and trying to do something new and impossible, you're going to mess up. Now, I would argue that magic being hard is also what makes magic worth it. Right? Trying to do something impossible actually makes that effort mean something. I think that if magic were easy, everyone could do it. There's, do you know Teller of Penn & Teller? He has this quote that I love, which is, most magic is just someone spending more time and effort on something than you could possibly imagine. And I love that because it's true. And because magic on stage is an act of care for your audience. Because even though you're not saying it out loud, what you are communicating is, I care so much about the time from your life you are giving me that I am going to try to move mountains to communicate something about my private experience, to op break that open so we can share that. Yeah? That's why magic is worth doing on stage, because at its best, right, magic is able to take the private, quiet things we feel and show us back the world, not as it is, but how we feel it to be. The things that we feel like, does anyone else feel this way? Is this embarrassing? Is this weird? And make that real in space. How validating and meaningful, right? To be able to create that on stage. And the magic element of it is, and, and what if it seemed real? You know what I mean? What if it wasn't a gesture at it or a metaphor? What if that's just real? Yeah? There's a communication of care in magic. Um, now, it's worth bringing up, what about the things that we know work? You know what I mean? What about convention? What about the way things are done? What about love for the text? Right? Because people will ask you these questions. You know what I mean? Why are you putting all these magic tricks in our town? Our town's supposed to be minimal. It has nothing. Right? Fair question. I think you should ask yourself those questions. Right? Why are we doing this musical like this? We know how Into the Woods works. Right? I think back to what we were saying about assumptions in that moment. Right? And how we tell stories impactfully. But also... I think the most respectful way you can tell a story, and the way you can respect a text if you really love it, is to change everything about theater to tell that story as impactfully, impactfully as possible. To me, say, that story and the people sharing the room with me are so much more important than any convention of how theater works. Right? We should be making productions that feel as special to the story as a basketball court is to the game of basketball. Right? 
why does theaters for every play look the same? I don't know. Right, these are questions that you're going to help me answer over the next 50, 100 years if we're all very, so lucky. Um, so just jumping back, because it, it's time to jump back, and then, and then I want to talk with you and uh, answer some of your questions. Uh, what are we going to do about these, uh, this ABBA show <laughs> with all this? Right? What are we going to do about it? I don't know. Right? Because we talked about the importance of limitations. Our limitations just went in space. Right? We have to justify why this specific group of people that gathered in a room together mattered, right? Why the fact that you are here, and you are here, and you are here, this specific group of people showing up and giving us time out of their lives mattered. And I don't have the answer yet, <laughs> right? Um, but what I will say is it comforts me to remember that every moment in history led to this group of people sharing a room together. And that there is power and potential in what happens in this room because everything that happens in the future will be because we shared a room together. You're going to have to think really big and outside the box to make these changes. I encourage you to think big and outside the box. There is no role in theater this does not apply to, right? You are a creator. If you're in this room, you're a creator. That's simple. And you can't force that responsibility on someone else because that's what, if you say, no, I'm an interpreter, right? I'm a technician, whatever. You're giving up a power that you truly have. Right? It's a responsibility. Um, so what I'll encourage you to do, as you're trying to figure out what we're going to do in the face of this ABBA show, is make work that vulnerably pushes the boundaries of what you can do and what is possible. Yeah? George C. Wolfe. Does anyone know that director, George C. Wolfe? Yeah. Excellent director. He, he says, um, if I'm working on a sh I, when I'm working on a show or choosing what shows to work on, um, I always think about if I were hit by a bus while in rehearsals for that show, would I be proud of the work I was doing? Would I be proud of the story I was telling? Maybe a nice thing for us to think about. Um, bring all of yourself to the table. Don't leave anything behind. If you have that weird little interest, if you're into training animals, that's useful, right? That's part of what makes you who you are. It's your responsibility to bring all of yourself to the table, and it's your responsibility to bring all of other people into a process with you. Yeah? Remember that your creativity and care determines what is possible on stage. I, there's no sentence I hate more than, oh, that's how we do it in a movie, right? The only thing that determines what is possible on stage is your creativity and care. That's it. And lead with your why. Why am I here? Why are we doing it like this? Why are we telling this story? Um, I, on the first day of Harry Potter rehearsals, I would teach someone how to, uh, to cast, because they're learning about magic. They've never done it before. How to make a poker chip disappear. It's like a silly piece of sleight of hand, but it has all the elements of, of magic in it. And then uh, and it helps them think about what magic does. And on opening night, I always give everyone in the cast a poker chip um, that says the last thing I want to say to you all today, um, because it is true. Uh, the poker chips say, always remember, you are the actual magic. Thank you so much. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a few questions for you, Skylar, and then we want to hear from you. So raise your hand and use those stage voices that I know all of you have. Um, my name is Jeremy. I'm from Broadway Plus. Uh, they were, SETC came to us for a keynote. Um, Skylar is one of our most beloved artists on our roster. We have over 600 artists, ranging from Laura Bell Bundy, Corey Cott, Billy Porter, an amazing amazing group of swings and understudies. Hello. Power to them. And what's fun is that we can bring them to you, whether it be your school, your local theater community, your local community theater, or Zoom, which is where Skylar and I met, we met on many Zoom. eons ago in good old 2021. But um, anyways, I actually in three have to run. I'm an adjunct teacher, so I'm going to run and teach my students, but I want to connect with you all later in the um, expo hall, so that's my story, I digress. Let's get to some questions because we want to hear from you. So you talk a lot about the collaboration process. Yeah. And may I add one thing? When you, when you spoke about emailing, it's so important. It is so important. Send the email. Be yourself. I was myself once, and it kind of put me into a weird position. I insulted a lead producer of a show in the elevator, not knowing he was a lead producer. Not going to say which show, and not going to say which producer, but I got a job. <laughs> I became his personal assistant. So anyways, I digress. He's now got five Tony Awards. So 
in this collaboration process, you meet with so many people. Who, what's, what are challenges that come up in that process? Collaborating on magic couldn't be harder. It's joyful, but it couldn't be harder, right? Because you are asking yourself to push the limit of what you can all do. And it is exact, and it is demanding, and it involves sacrifice across the board, right? Scenic can't do everything they want to do the way they want to do it. Lighting can't do everything they want to do the way they want to do it. Direction can't use their time the way they want to use it because you're going to have to slow the heck down if you want to make something impossible happen, right? But I have had some of the most meaningful conversations and collaborations making magic in theater. Of all the work I do, you know, I spend a lot of time directing, and really when we are working on magic, it gets people down to kind of their raw core, and that's what's hard about it, right? Like, what am I willing to give up to tell this story a certain way? What matters about this story to me? And sometimes you don't agree, right? And then the other things are, um, you know, and it's work I try to do, but how you bring everyone along. Because if you have someone who doesn't feel like it or is not into it, it's not going to happen. It is, magic is like a thing we make in the air every night, again and again and again. And if you have a, a deck carpenter who's not feeling it, doesn't feel included, doesn't feel part of it, doesn't get what's happening, is not interested, that magic is not going to happen. It's that simple. So I think one of the struggles, I'll say, is that magic in theater, the way I do it, even though it's been around forever, feels quite new, thinking of magic as a design role. And oftentimes, a lot of the work is having to go to the people, <laughs> go to the people who hired you and said, we want to work with you, and be like, OK, so if you want that, <laughs> this is what that actually means and looks like. You know what I mean? That's what this will mean. And teaching people a new way of working together. Um, so it's, it's hard. It's like emotionally exhausting because you have to uh, speak to not only your own worth, but the worth of your colleagues and the worth of your industry and your creative collaboration every time you walk into a room. Um, and, but, you know, it's worth it. It's 100% worth it. Lovely. And it gives you such great, like, interpersonal skills for later on, you know. I, you know, I teach a lot of um, empathy and vulnerability with my kids because I teach for primarily athletes. Mm -hmm. So it's an online private school and all these kids are like going to be the next Serena and Venus, but they don't have time to go to school, but they have to get their GED. None of them have ever looked at a monologue in their life. And literally, they are so excited. I'm actually, we're working on our monologues today at three. Um, they grow so much and they learn so much about themselves and the theater and acting is really, you know, getting into the mental health. That's a whole other topic that I'd love to talk to you all about. But again, I want to hear from you guys. But one more thing. What is, what's your future, of, what do you think is the future of theater? Oh my gosh. Um, well, as I said, I don't know. Uh, so my company, Night Drive, a lot of the work we do is trying to answer this question. Um, we start every play we make as what we call like very experienced beginners, because we're always starting in a form that we've never worked in before and is non-theatrical. So we're making a show right now that's a um, full tackle football game. Um, uh, we're doing another one right now that is a participatory focus group that's performed with the actors and audience around a giant 50 person boardroom table that they all share. Um, well, they do exercises together. Um, I think the thing that we constantly come back to is the future of theater. We want to make work that makes people feel less small and less alone. And I think to do that, you have to make work that genuinely takes in the presence of all the individuals in the room and lets it affect the show, right? And affects the show in a meaningful way, not in like a clap for Tinkerbell way, um, because, you know, that's something we call mandatory fun. I thought that's no hate on Peter Pan. Love Peter Pan. But it's the challenge of when you feel forced to maybe not, what if someone doesn't want to clap? How can they be that person in the room and it actually makes your show better, right? So it's about thinking about, well, what if we gave, what if we gave up on uh, the audience having a special place to sit? What if the audience and actors all sit in the same place? You know, the qu asking questions like that. What if we gave up on the structure of theater? What if it can be four quarters and people can order food in the middle of it? You know what I mean? Asking these questions, we're pushing towards how can we connect in a more deeply personal way with the people who show up? Because I fundamentally think the most hopeful and radical thing about theater is strangers sharing space. I mean, how rare is that now? When so much of the space we share is virtual, sharing space with strangers who might not think or act like you, right? That's radical. How do we use that space? Awesome. I le I've, I've learned so much from Skyler over the past three years and today, and he's such a treasure to work with. I want to hear from you, so let's take some questions. So the way this is going to work, if you'll raise your hand, we'll bring you a microphone. Can you turn this up just a little bit? 
We'll bring your microphone so everyone else can hear you. Zaria also has a microphone over there if you'd like to raise your hand. And I'll keep answering questions as long as you want. Like, I know Jeremy will have to run, but I, I'm here for you. So as long as I'm allowed, keep talking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Skylar, you mentioned that magicians tend to be on the forefront of accepting new technologies. Yeah. And uh, here at the beginning of artificial intelligence, uh, I'm wondering what your take is on that. Oh and gosh, if you're scared yeah. of it, if you're embracing it, wh where do you stand? We were oh, just talking God. about that we were... last night. Oh, my gosh. Um, I mean... Okay. Well, to be fair, of course I'm scared, right? We've had so many stories about AI... Um, changing the world for the worst, right? Like, we're scared that artificial intelligence we built because we built a society, unfortunately, around cultural domination, right? And, like, uh, kind of various forces of colonialism, white supremacy, that, like, that's baked into our AI. That's scary to me, right? Um, what's exciting about it? I mean, if, you know, there's something potentially radical, like, what if human beings only had to do creative work? There's something interesting to that, right? What if artificial intelligence could take care of non-creative work? And what if we were allowed to have leisure time and creative work, right? What if we could build a society that could economically and socially and politically support the people inside of it? That's exciting, right? I think the thing that is challenging to human beings about AI and the thing that I go into is that if you believe, and this is so off magic topic, I'm sorry, but this is like, if you believe that artificial intelligence will become sentient in the next 10 to 20 years, and I do, based on the speed of technology, right? You have to contend with the idea that the only way we can live collaboratively with the AI is to share our knowledge symbiotically. Does that make sense? And it will mean a certain amount of giving up of our individual individuality and agency, but at its best, it could mean something really amazing and collective. We've built a whole world around this idea of like individual identity and finding out who we are. But I think what I love about theater is it challenges us to be like, what if we gave up our individual identity a little bit for the sake of making something bigger than us together, right? What if we cared more about this than about me? And so I think there's something philosophical it's going to push us to do that's really exciting. Yeah, hi. And first, a shout out to Broadway Plus, started by a former student of mine, Nate Hill. So hi to Nate. Yes, Nathaniel. Um, I know about you. We have to talk after. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, so thank you. This is really interesting. And I, I do a lot of work with um, arts access for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what sort of challenges and opportunities that that has drawn you to in, yes. in the work that you do. That is a great question. And it is, you know, one of the first things we were trying to figure out when we made Harry Potter was how are we going to make a sensitive, like a... Um, a light and sound sensitive version of the show so that people with uh, disabilities, people who have light and sound sensitivity could experience this, right? Because fundamentally the magic, unfortunately, is like super based on light and sound and all these things. And we figured it out, right? So at, at one point, you know, it's just another interesting impossible challenge, right? How do you do this with a new set of limitations? How do you do this in a way that makes it accessible? I would say that uh, an exciting place to go and something that, you know, we were talking about earlier, um, we were talking about earlier, is uh, making immersive work accessible. Because we think about here, right, working with an interpreter, for an example, we're all facing the same direction. What do you do when you're all walking around a space together, right? How do you deal with the fact that there's still something unfair to deaf and hard of hearing people in this experience, right? Because they have to go like this. Well, everyone else just gets to watch me like this, right? How do we actually stage this work into our work, right? in a way that's really exciting. Do you know what I mean? From a magic perspective, who knows what that can mean? Like, can a character grow an extra set of hands that can sign while someone else is acting on stage? Like, what can you do that uses magic to push accessibility, right? I also think it ultimately creates, you know, thinking about disability and arts access in your work creates work that's more innovative and more exciting for everyone, right? And not just, because, you know, not every play is about ability inherently, but it kind of is, right? Bodies on stage mean that you are making work about disability all the time, right? And something interesting, I just worked on a show, You Will Get Sick, which is specifically about acquired disability. And we, one of the things we don't think about a lot is that disability is something that almost all of us will have to deal with personally in our lifetime, right? And so one of the things we were talking about in that play is how do we represent the experience of disability in a way that is authentic 
but also can be accessed by people with disability, right? That is a real interesting challenge. Like, I have a friend who has severe concussions from being hit by a car um, and uh, is disabled as a result, and she often can't see shows about people with brain damage because they use strobe lights in a way and use sound in a way that she can't take in. Think about that, right? So the most exciting opportunity is how can we use what's accessible to break open new ways of expressing ourselves in theater? Well, um, hi. I, I was handed the microphone, and um, this is really interesting because my question is a little bit uh, on the other side of that because as a blind artist, I am consistently looking for ways to, uh, to, break, to break convention and to create art um, with, with a visual disability. Now, as a blind consumer of art, I wonder um, from your end, is, are there ways that you all use other sensory, um, you know, other ways to appeal to senses so that someone who can't see the magic, so to speak, gets to experience that as well? Is that something that you, you have in the works or something you guys have, have done already? That is such a good question. And it is actually something I was thinking of because I've made a couple of shows recently with Night Drive that we've made, they, 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 they're, they're not about this, but have made specifically for um, visually impaired or with a visually impaired audience in mind because they are largely performed very close to you. Um, and most of the magic that is happening is participatory and mental. So it is not happening as visually. It is happening between the people and based on what they're saying in the space, right? Magic is not limited to a visual language. If we think about things like mentalism, for example, right, where we're actually dealing with the way we share thoughts, that is a space that's wildly accessible and hasn't really been tapped a lot in theater, even though it's really exciting, right? When we talk about how to make people feel seen in a space, has anyone heard of the show In and of Itself? In and of Itself is a you can watch it on Hulu, and you should. It was a magic show directed by Frank Oz. And when you walk into the theater, there's a wall of thousands of cards that say, I am, and then they say something like, I am an astronaut, I am a believer, I'm A, a through Z, you know, I am a supporter, um, I am a mom, right? And you pick one for yourself, and you hold it close to you, so you put it in your pocket, whatever, during the show. And at the end of the show, the last thing uh, the performer does is he says, anyone who picked something that is true to you, that, you know, it wasn't so much a joke, but really feels true to you, right? And maybe specifically feels true to you and is not a way you feel recognized in your life. Can you stand up? And he walked through and said to each of them, you are this, you are this, you are, right? It is ultimately an entirely audio, audible piece of magic. Yeah? Right? But how incredibly impactful to make all of those people feel seen in that way. It was a real innovative moment in a theater. Right? And as it happens, a deeply accessible piece of magic telling a story. So it's something we're thinking about and working towards. And I think the limit is only our imagination as we think about how we can make pieces of magic that are radically accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. You were saying one of the things that makes a play different is not going with what you expected. What if you have a director who changes it so much, it ruins the magic of the show? Huh. That is a good question. I mean, I think it's one of those things where, like, the magic of the show is such a fragile thing, isn't it? Right? Like, the thing that makes it work for someone can make it fall apart for someone else. And it's so personal. And that's where, like, I think leading with the why is so useful, right? Like, when I'm talking to a director, and I don't know why they're doing something, I don't know how to help them. I don't know how to make decisions that support them, right? I don't know why they're making the show like that. So I go back to that. Like, like why are we doing it that way? Like, what is the feel? That, how do you, I ask this question all the time. I encourage you to do the same thing. How do you want this moment to make people feel? And as directors, because I'm also a director, is anyone in the room directors? Do we have directors in the room? Anyone? Well, yeah. I encourage you, it can be very easy from the perspective of a designer or an actor, right? When you're working for a director, and I've learned this now as a designer. When you're a director, you're focused on what's the audience's experience. When you're a designer or an actor, you're thinking, what is the director thinking? And you have so much singular attention on you. 
So I encourage directors, I work on doing this all the time, to refocus everyone's attention out. This is why we're doing this. This is why I want to make this play with you all, right? And this is what I want the story to communicate. We should all be thinking about how that happens most effectively. I want people to argue with me and say, I don't think that's going to do that, but they can't argue with me if they're just arguing on my taste. Right? Because that's my taste. I can't change that, and they can't change that. They can say, I wor- like, if you want this moment to move people, I worry it's funny. Do you know what I mean? I am worried we're doing something that's actually funny. And maybe I meant for it to be funny. Maybe that's an opportunity for me to say, hey, like, I- actually, I think there's something that opens us up about this being a little bit funny. It's funny and movie at the same time. Or maybe like, oh, I didn't realize that. So it's, maybe there's something embarrassing in this moment for that person, right? It gives us an access point and a way for other people in the process to fight towards the same thing with us, rather than just kind of shoot in the dark and be like, do you like it? So I'd say go back to your why when you're working on a show like that, right? Why do you want it to be like this? Because that is a way to tap into how to support a vision and make it better. <laughs> it's okay. And now you do. The director's why is always just because. He doesn't have a reason. I've, I've worked with him before, and his concepts are unique. Hey, we've all been there, right? Has anyone else worked with someone that's like, why is it like this, right? Yes? Anyone? Anyone? Let's raise hands just like supportively. Yes, thank you. You know what? That's just going to be some people. That's just going to be some people. And this is where you're choosing the rooms you walk into, right? And what you want to do. I think that's the truth. You know, some, there are people like Bob. Does anyone know the director, Bob Wilson? Yeah, okay, Einstein on the Beach. He, look, you look up his stuff. It is wild. It is interesting. Some of it is boring. Some of it is really cool. And if you ask him why, he is not going to tell you. He is not interested. This is what it is. There's something deep within him that he wants to make work that looks like this. Okay. Right? And it's our choice. Like, it's your choice as a designer, a technician, an actor, a stage manager. Do you want to work with that person? You know what I mean? And it's a real, it's a question worth asking. Hello. Hi. Um, All right. So my question is, a lot of times, as a creative, a lot of limitations can seem like challenges at first. Mm -hmm. And then vice versa, a lot of challenges can seem like hard limitations. Yeah. So when you're coming up with these ideas and uh, visions that you want to put onto the stage, how do you know when to back off and change or when to double down? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, Well, I think to make magic, to do the job I do, you have to be a bit of like a, a toxic optimist. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, that's, uh, I'm like, it's always going to work. It's going to be great. And then we're going to put more in it. That's just who I am, right? Um, and it's humbling because you're also dealing with other people who aren't used to seeing things fail on their way to succeeding at the same rate that you are. And it's embarrassing, right? Failing publicly is embarrassing. So I try to warn people, but they don't know how it's going to feel for them until they're doing it. You know what I mean? Until we're in front of a thousand people and something messes up. And they're like, we have to cut it! You know? Like, that, that's a key moment. I think... I was in rehearsal the other day, and I've been trying to make this moment work in Fat Ham. And the actor said, you know, Skylar, I just feel like I just want to walk off stage. I don't want to disappear. I just feel like there's this really beautiful moment happening, and I feel like I just need to fade away. And I've been watching it, and I was like, you know, you're right, Billy. Like, you're right. This isn't a moment. Like, it doesn't fit the beat. The playwright had rewritten the scene since we designed the magic. You know what I mean? And your ability to see that, again, it isn't serving the why anymore, and be honest about that, buys you so much more cred when you're like, you're tripling down. This thing is not leaving the show. You know, I have, I have been on the last day of previews with a director threatening to cut something if we don't get it right. Being like, we are not going to let this get cut. And sometimes that's right. Because the why is there. It's like, it's, this isn't only cool, but it's meaningful. You know? Anything that's only cool, not worth your time. But cool and meaningful, it's worth your time. Okay, we have time for one more question. Do you have a favorite trick in The Cursed Child? Oh, yes, I do. 
It's hard. I mean, they're my baby. Like, yeah, I love them so much. Um, I love poly. This is not ruining anything for anyone because you're not going to know what it is until you see it. But I love Polyjuice because every set of actors who do it do it differently. Um, it's very personal. Like, we get to make it all over the world with different people, different combinations of people, with understudies going on all the time. There's something lively about it and joyful. I think it, it um, cracks open some little seed of joy in the show that's needed in that moment. And then uh, the thing that I fell in love with visually when I first saw it was the phone booth. That I was like, that is the most unbelievably just visually beautiful thing. Um, so th those are my two favorites from that. Yeah. Everyone go see it next time you're in New York. Any group sales, email me. I'll get you a ticket. Um, Skylar Fox, thank you so much for you all your insight. You well. Woo! Okay. Yes. Your time and talent. I've got to run, but we're going to be touring the Expo Hall from 4 to 7. So if you see us, I mean, you can't miss him. He's so tall. Um, come say hi. Let's continue the conversation. And thank you all so much. Good luck with auditions. Yes. I heard some amazing singing. And, you know, respect your teachers and love yourself. Thanks, y'all. Bye, y'all. Thanks so much.